Mark Garnier, Member of Parliament, the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Brunei, Myanmar and Thailand. Ken O'Flaherty, the UK Government's COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. Natalie Gowers Barnes, Deputy High Commissioner of the British High Commission. Siva Subramaniam, the Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Principal at Laksamana College. Yang Mulia Haji Karudin bin Haji Abdul Hamid, Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Finance and Economy. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and a very warm welcome to this virtual conversation organized by the British High Commission and the Britain Brunei Business Forum. We are delighted to be joined today by Mark Garnier, uh, the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Brunei, and Ken O'Flaherty, um, the UK government's COP26 ambassador, who are both in the UK. The aim of today's discussion is to hear about their respective roles and explore how UK and Brunei can develop their business relations and also to understand COP26 and to better understand how Brunei can be part of that exciting journey. My name is Alan Lai and I work with the UK ASEAN Business Council, which is a UK-based organization that helps UK companies grow in Southeast Asia. And I have the pleasure of being based in Brunei. To kick us off, I'd like to invite Natalie gowers barnes the Deputy High Commissioner, to say a few words of welcome. Hi, um, Salamat Patang. I'm gonna stand up, if I may. Um, hello to our guests in Europe, in the UK, uh, Mr. Mark Garnier, MP, and to Ken O'Flaherty, uh, Ambassador, um, who's based in Italy at the moment. Um, Salamat Patang, um, to um, dear members, dear guests, distinguished guests, young Mulia Haji Karudin, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor to be here with you all today. And I'd like to just take a moment to particularly thank the BBBF board, um, its new chair, Siva, and my dearest colleagues, Matthew, Sabrina, and Karen, as well as UK ABC, Alan Lai, um, for bringing together such a wonderfully diverse audience and to Laksamana College, of course, for hosting us. So it gives me enormous pleasure to be here um, to welcome our keynote speakers, Mr. Mark Garnier, MP, the UK Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Brunei, Dar es Salaam, and Ambassador Ken O'Flaherty in charge of the UK government's COP26 for Asia, Pacific and South Asia. So this event is in two halves. The first is to get to know Mr. Mark Garnier MP um, a bit better um, and this is particularly within the context of Brunei's economic diversification and energy transition agendas with the focus on skills and technology which are really essential to future to a clean resilient and inclusive growth um, and Ken Ambassador Ken will graciously anchor our thinking on the year 2021 as a critical year for the climate as we move forward to November. As you all know, COP26 will be happening in Glasgow this November, um, hosted by the UK. Um, quite a chilly month, but um, it should be good. <laughs> um, and it goes without saying that we have an individual and collective responsibility towards the environment. I bought my um, reusable plastic bottle here, filled with water. Um, I was lucky enough just a few weeks ago to be trekking um, through the primary rainforest here in Tembron in Brunei. And I have to say what a privilege it is um, not, to, not to have done five hours of trekking, <laughs> but to, to have that experience as someone coming from the UK. Um, and I hope in many generations to come, other people will be saying that they have the same privilege here because it's pretty unique for anyone to experience that globally. So thank you to Brunei. Um, so I really want hope that everyone will take part. No question is too simple or too silly. Um, we want this to be really interactive. Um, and so that's all from me. Thank you. And now I'm handing over to, to Siva, uh, excellent chair. Ms. Natalie Barnes, Deputy British High Commissioner to Brunei Darussalam, distinguished speakers, Mr. Mark Garnier and Mr. Ken O'Flaherty, Yang Mulia Aji Karurin, from the Secretary of Minister of Finance and Economy, Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. 
And for Mark and Ken, a very good morning. Thank you very much for your attendance at today's virtual audience organized, jointly by Britain Brunei Business Forum and the British ICOM. As chair of the BBVF and also as CEO of Luxembourg College of Business, I'd like to bid all of you a very warm welcome. Today's event promises to be insightful and interesting as we learn about Mark's work as the UK Prime Minister Trade and War, including his thoughts on area of future UK Brunei and UK ASEAN collaboration. We also hear yeah, from Ken about the UK's presidency of the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 and learn more about the Race to Zero campaign. I'm sure we can't wait to get started. And I will hand over to Alan to kick off the event now. And thank you very much. Thank you, Seva. I, I feel the pressure to stand up now. But now we now would like to turn to uh, Mark Garnier, MP, the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy, to deliver his keynote address. Um, Mark has been the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy uh, for the, this is his second time. He previously uh, served in this role um, and was also the uh, trade in the trade as a trade minister between 2016 and 2018. And he came to Brunei in 2016, I understand. And we'd love to have you back again. Uh, when travel uh, permits. He's got a very rich history with, in the uh, City of London as an investment banker, working on the stock exchange in his earlier days, and uh, has a wealth of knowledge in the finance industry. So I'm looking forward to peppering him on a few finance questions a little bit later on. But uh, Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. You're a huge supporter of UK-ASEAN relations. You're also chair of the ASEAN um, All-Party Parliamentary Group uh, in Westminster. So thank you very much for your strong support. Over to you, sir, for your keynote address. Alan, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm, I'm frequently reminded when, uh, when people give me a quick introduction and say that I was a former investment banker, hedge fund manager, and now a politician, that I have the hat trick of the three most uh, controversial jobs, perhaps known to, known to mankind. Um, but members of the uh, Britain Brunei Business Forum, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it, it really is a genuine pleasure to be able to, to, to join you today. And I'd certainly like to thank the BBBF board, led by its new chair, Siva Subramanian, for, for organising this event. And I'd also like to thank Le Lexamana College for, uh, for hosting us. Um, as a UK Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Brunei, my mission is to deepen the UK Brunei, UK Brunei economic and commercial relationship, building on our, our really very rich history of cooperation and friendship. And this event forms part of a week-long virtual tour that I'm having to Brunei, comprising events designed to help me better understand where the opportunities and partnerships lie. As, um, as Alan mentioned, I, I was previously the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Brunei back in, back in 2016 and subsequently went on to become a Trade Minister. But when I first came over to Brunei, there were, it struck me there were many, many opportunities uh, that we could develop between the UK, particularly in areas, for example, such as Sharia finance. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be back doing actually what I find a much far more enjoyable job as a, as a trade envoy than I did perhaps as a, uh, as a minister. Uh, Grand being a minister is, at least you can actually do some really useful work as a trade envoy. But this event represents uh, a chance to explore really how our two-way trade can grow. And I think it's striking that despite the pandemic, total trade in goods and services between the UK and Brunei grew to 147 million pounds last year. So there's undeniably scope to do more, but that the Brunei economy bucked the trend and grew in 2020 is a testament to, to the Brunei government's robust response to COVID-19. And the economy pr proved remarkably resilient, helped by uh, a new entrepreneurial streak that brought about all manner of new startups in Brunei. So I have to acknowledge the UK has not done quite so well. Our economy has shrunk by 10%, which is the largest fall in over 300 years. Uh, that goes back to the great frost of 1709 when the River Thames froze over. Um, and also our borrowing is now at its highest level outside of, uh, of any wartime uh, period. But there is of course hope. Our National Health Service has had an extraordinary success already providing over half the adult population with their first vaccine dose. And meanwhile our economic response has been recognised by the International uh, Monetary Fund as one of the most comprehensive and generous in the world. And as a result, the UK's Office for Budgetary Responsibility is forecasting a swifter and more sustainable recovery than we previously projected back to the pre-COVID-19 uh, COVID levels 
by mid-2022, which is approximately six months earlier than we were expecting. But beyond the UK, the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca's vaccine, a feat of really quite staggering human ingenuity, is proving integral to global recovery. Uh, Oxford AstraZeneca's vaccinations are already taking place in some of the world's poorest countries, funded by COVAX, the COVID-19 Global Vaccines Access Facility, to which the UK has pledged just under £550 million. We look forward to the recently announced vaccine programme getting underway in Brunei. So 2021 is a significant year for Brunei, marking its ASEAN chairmanship. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure that this coincides with His Majesty's turning, uh, turning 75 years. ASEAN, of course, matters to the UK. Um, as Alan said, I chair the, uh, the all-party parliamentary group for ASEAN in the, in the UK Parliament. Our relationship is long-standing, deep and broad. Our close ties are evidenced by bilateral trade, which between 2010 and, and 2019 grew by 50% to over £40 billion. Pounds. And all this supports a huge number of jobs, companies and communities, both in the UK and in ASEAN nations. And this includes the micro, small and medium sized enterprises that form the backbones of, of both of our economies. <clears throat> we welcome the theme of Brunei's chairmanship, coupled with Brunei's recently released uh, priority economic deliverables. We care, we share and we prosper is a message that resonates with, with the UK. Like you, recovery, digitalization and sustainability matter to us and there is enormous scope to work together on this important agenda, growing our two-way trade in a way that improves lives and livelihoods and protects the environment. 2021 is also a significant year for the UK. Firstly, of course, we look forward to hosting the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, in Glasgow in November. This is a vital dialogue in terms of limiting global warming and delivering net zero targets by 2050. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Ken O'Flaherty, the UK government's COP26 regional ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. Under our presidency, we want to accelerate transition in the global economy in energy, transport and finance. We want to build adaptation and resilience and arrest and reverse biodiversity loss. Our presidency falls during the first significant test of the Paris Agreement, where countries are expected to reassess their national commitments we're working closely with partners across ASEAN to encourage national commitments that are both robust and ambitious. I'm delighted that Brunei has made sustainability a cornerstone of its ASEAN chairmanship. 2020 saw record temperatures. We saw fires rage across the world. We saw storms intensify. In short, the climate crisis is closing in. ASEAN is a region particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Business action is vitally important to achieving a successful climate summit and COP26 presidency. We are calling on companies across ASEAN to join the Race to Zero, a global campaign to mobilise leadership and support from businesses, cities, regions and investors towards a zero carbon economy that creates jobs and unlocks sustainable growth. Ken, I'm sure, will set out what the Race to Zero means for those in this room and how you can get involved. And I hope the Brunei names will join the ranks over the coming months. I certainly warmly encourage those of you interested in participating to make contact with the British High Commission. The 2021 is also significant for the UK as we build on our engagement with ASEAN. 2020 marked a year of first in the UK-ASEAN relationship. In June, we submitted our application for ASEAN Dialogue Partner Status, highlighting our dedication to deeper engagement across all of ASEAN's pillars, part of the UK's broader tilt towards the Indo-Pacific region. We also saw the first ever UK-ASEAN economic and foreign dialogues, which we hope will, will continue this year. In December 2020, our Secretary of State for International Trade visited Singapore and Vietnam, signing agreements with both countries. The UK-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement locks in the preferential market access secured under the EU-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, and the Singapore Agreement ensures UK businesses maintain enhanced access to our largest trading partner in ASEAN. All this flows from the UK having left the European Union, assuming its position as an independent nation with an ambitious trade policy. The UK government has announced uh, its aim of securing free trade agreements with countries covering 80% of UK trade within three years of leaving the EU. We've already, indeed, we've already agreed trade deals with 64 countries plus the EU, accounting for some £890 billion of UK bilateral trade in 2019. Negotiations are underway with the US, Australia and New Zealand, and in February we submitted our notification of intent to begin the CPTPP accession process and look forward to negotiations 
there beginning in due course. And it's also worth mentioning that only yesterday we signed a memorandum of understanding to introduce the Joint Economic and Trade uh, Committee um, talks with Thailand. Um, so this is a very, very dynamic area. ASEAN dialogue partner status, coupled with CPTPP accession, a mechanism by which the UK-Brunei relationship can be taken to the next level. Brunei recently unveiled its economic blueprint with a view to supporting energy transition and diversifying the, the economy beyond oil and gas, currently representing the overwhelming majority of GDP and exports. The UK is supportive of this, and I look forward to hearing your views on what more we can do to support Brunei's ambitions. Another pillar of our engagement with Brunei's education, the Nisai Group recently opened its uh, regional hub in Brunei, delivering quality assured innovative educational programs across Asia and further afield. We're also exploring partnering with Brunei on ICT in the classroom and tech-based approach to increasing financial literacy. The ASEAN Education is Great campaign continues to go from strength to strength and is backed up by some impressive statistics. Pre-COVID-19, 43 thousand ASEAN students were studying in universities in the United Kingdom and there were over 125,000 students in ASEAN member states studying for British higher education qualifications in their home countries. So we continue to offer a warm, an, uh, a warm welcome to international students from ASEAN and their presence makes an invaluable social and cultural contribution to UK campuses. Our new graduate route which comes into force this summer would allow international students the option to remain in the UK for two years post-study to work or seek employment. We recognise just how important and enriching reciprocal student exchanges can be, and that's why the UK government has launched the Turing Scheme, which aims to fund over 35,000 UK students to study internationally, including education and vocational education and student uh, institutions in Southeast Asia. Industry placements are also in scope, and we're eager to, de to deepen existing reciprocal arrangements with Brunei and keen to learn where there exist scopes to partner. We ask that Southeast Asian governments and providers engage with the scheme and consider how they can support placements to the UK so we can all share and enjoy the mutual benefits of international mobility. So I'm incredibly proud to have been appointed again the Prime Minister's uh, trade envoy to serve uh, to Brunei. Uh, our bilateral rela relationship is, as I say, historic, strong, and it offers tremendous scope to do much more together. So I very much look forward to hearing from all of you and taking any questions, and indeed to working closely with Brunei going forward. And I very, very much look forward to the time when I can come out to Brunei, uh, which on my last occasion proved to be an incredibly welcome and incredibly happy and, uh, and, and, and energetic country. So I'm very, very much looking forward to coming uh, back out to see you all properly face to face. So thank you again for inviting me to speak uh, here today at today's CBF event. Uh, Alan, back to you. Thank you very much for that wonderful tour de force of the UK, ASEAN, UK, Brunei relationship. But this is a conversation. We'd now like to invite all of you to pose your thoughts, comments, questions to Mr. Mark Garnier um, on anything really. Um, he's got a wonderful wealth of experience. So if you could raise your hand when you have a question and introduce yourself uh, and pose your question. Um, I'd like to go first, uh, Mark, and you mentioned earlier about FinTech. And this is a growing area within uh, Southeast Asia. It's, it's developing within Brunei. Could you talk a little bit about the work that's going on with the, uh, the UK as a FinTech leader and what's happening within Southeast Asia? And, and perhaps how can Brunei get involved in that FinTech space? Um, well, fintech is an absolutely fascinating area. There was, um, I met a, a fintech champion in the UK not so very long ago, who pointed out that I think of the seven and a half billion people that live on the planet, I think something like three billion of them have access to a bank account, and about five billion have access to a SIM card. And it really illustrates the point that actually the future of finance is going to be through your mobile telephone rather than through the traditional bank accounts. Um, so this is why I think apart from anything else, uh, fintech is so incredibly important. Um, there's no doubt about it in the UK, uh, as, as, as I think most people know, we have an incredibly mature and sophisticated financial services uh, industry based around the city of London. And it's really, I think, an enormous um, uh, opportunity for fintech companies. And we've seen in Shoreditch a sort of fintech hub that's been setting up just on the edge of the city of London. Um, so that's great for us. But I think what's really important is that 
there are brilliant people across the whole of the world uh, coming up with ideas in fintech and in particular in, in ASEAN. And um, what we've done in order to try to bring together all of this knowledge is we've launched the UK Southeast Asia fintech series where we're trying to basically engage to spread really sort of best, not, uh, best practice, best knowledge, you know, innovation in order to make sure that we can grow uh, this area in a whole variety of different ways. And I think also, Alan, it's worth bearing in mind that, that, that fintech isn't just a technology. Um, we also have to remember that around this become, uh, there, there is a regulatory um, requirement in order to make sure that we, you know, people are safe using this. What we don't want to do is for people to suddenly discover that they, they started using fintech, which is great and very innovative and very imaginative, but suddenly discover that it's an unregulated space. And so don't get that. Uh, protection that everybody would expect. So one of the things that the UK regulators have done is create um, what's known as the regulatory sandbox, um, which is essentially where you can try new technology, go into this safe regulatory space and see how it works and see how the regulations work. All of this provides really, really great opportunities for, for, for fintech innovators uh, and regulators. And this is something which we absolutely need to share. It's hopeless for us to try to keep it to ourselves. The only way this works is by having, having engagement across, uh, across the whole of the world. And with ASEAN being one of the fastest growing economic uh, trading blocks in the world, I think um, ASEAN is destined to be the biggest economic trading block by 2050 if it continues to grow at current rates. You know, it would be crazy if we weren't working really, really hand in glove with ASEAN to make sure that we all benefit from this this innovative uh, technology. Thank you very much. And we are um, thinking of, of how to bring that FinTech series to Brunei. We're in conversations with the team in Singapore. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to rolling that out here. Can I invite uh, questions from the audience, please? So, Tuan Aji Khairuddin from Permanent Secretary at the uh, Ministry of Finance and Economy. Good security. So we, yeah, we we have uh, invested uh, in, in some capacity uh, recently. Uh, project for uh, 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 cultivation uh, So, but we would like to uh, work with. Just to uh, think that I mean, there is also something in the works uh, that we would like to champion is in terms of digitizing uh, conception. Brunei is still quite um, uh, an economy that is based on notes and points. Um, this uh, statistics shows that uh, about 80% of things. Commercial transaction and retail transaction is still based on uh, physical cash and coin. So that, that is something that we, we are 
actually uh, we're working with the financial institutions here to, to, to come up with a, a modality to replace well, well not replace but uh, maybe move some of the transaction into digital uh, space so, You talk about uh, education and training. Uh, yeah, that's something that we would like to pursue. Uh, and this is my first time to Laksmana. I'm, I'm really surprised that they have a, a thousand student population here, which is, you know, compared to the other universities. And this is a, a small uh, space for you know, per capita student. I think it's most, the most dense. Uh, so, but it is something that is important to the country, uh, trying to uh, educate uh, our population, train them, and we um, also focus on life, life uh, long learning. So that's, uh, I think, a theme that we would uh, like to uh, ensure that is happening because, uh, of course, uh, we cannot stop, stop learning. Uh, Things are always changing. Um, I it's not that I I, I was having uh, you know, asking for uh, specific things. Uh, I just want to explain the things that, that is possible for us to talk about uh, going forward. But these are the topics that I, I see that you have mentioned and and something that we, we can work on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duan. And Mark, I'm not sure if you, you could hear all of that because I know I'm getting messages from my colleague. The sound was um, uh, a bit problematic, but um, Tonaji Karudin is the Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Finance and Economy and uh, was talking about Brunei's efforts towards renewable energy. And this is something that um, perhaps we could also hear from Ambassador um, uh, Ken in a minute as well. Um, rice, um, also in, in agriculture, this is a move that the country is moving towards. Uh, certainly for uh, self-sufficiency in rice, um, and also the uh, the issue of food security. Uh, also on fintech, uh, he was mentioning that uh, Brunei is moving uh, towards developing its fintech ecosystem and being a cashless society, uh, and also the importance of education and training, and highlighting the opportunities for collaboration in, in all of those areas, but um, particularly in education and training, I think that's something that uh, the UK has a lot to offer on. No, that's, that, 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 that's absolutely right. It's one of the, um, the, there was a great comment that somebody uh, made to me not so very long ago when talking actually about the Middle East. And it was, it was a comment about the progress of humanity. And they said that the, that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of rocks. And I think one of the things that's happening at the moment is, is of course, we are moving forward from the, um, the oil and gas and the petrochemical uh, period of our, of our humanity's development into something new. And it's going to be incredibly interesting to see what happens in terms of how countries adapt. And there are many countries, and Brunei is one of them, that have uh, done particularly well out of the, the petrochemical industry. And certainly the, the last 100 years has marked a you know, very, very important, or 120 years or so, has marked a very important period of history for humanity. But we need to move on. And, um, and I think that it is, it is partly because I suppose ultimately will be running low on oil and gas reserves, but, but actually is to do with the fact that I think the human race has now realized that the, the, the value of our planet, and actually Brunei, you know, surrounded by a primary rainforest, is a perfect example of actually just how, how stunningly beautiful the planet really is. So we, so, so every country will, will that, that, that is similar to Brunei or Saudi Arabia or Iran, and Iraq, will have, to, will have to look to see how their economies can develop. And, and I think it's how countries grasp that opportunity will, will dictate how well they do in the future. Moving to renewable energy is, is incredibly important. If you have that oil and gas reserve and that oil and gas revenue, that money, and we can see in some countries, can be invested into being a leading nation in development and research into renewable energies. And there's any number of, of, of different things that we can look at. I mean, we obviously look, you know, um, a, a sunlight, the energy that comes from the sun. We also have the energy that blows around the planet in the form of wind. We also have the energy that comes from the moon in the form of tides. And certainly in somewhere like the UK, where our tides can be as high as 40 foot difference, 
there's a lot of movement of water that could be turned into energy. So there's also interesting things that we can do there. Um, but but the permanent secretary really picks up on a very, very important point is that it's not just about energy, but it's what do you use that energy for? How do you use it? And we are seeing any number of, of, of innovative ways of, of, for example, addressing agriculture. Um, you know, I've seen across the world incredibly innovative systems of vertical farms where you can see all sorts of salad crops being grown in, in let's say, vertical, vertical areas rather than horizontal, typically. Um, we've got, uh, as, as Prime Secretary talks about, the financial ecosystem. And I think one particular area over and above fintech that Brunei could, could really, really exploit and do very well at is the whole area of, um, of Sharia finance and doing Sharia finance uh, support systems. So fund administration, uh, all of that type of stuff that goes on in the background of, of, of financial services, sort of behind stock markets, where where uh, Brunei can really, really make the most of the um, uh, of its of its Sharia status, in terms of making a very, very strong deliverable in terms of Sharia finance. So it's going to be a fascinating time for Brunei. Really, really interesting and and, and, and a really exciting opportunity. Um, and it's great to hear the permanent secretary recognizing that and really embracing it. So, so you know, we look forward to playing our part in helping. Thank you very much. May I see a show of hands for questions, please? Perhaps we'll take uh, two, two questions or three questions at a time. We've got Dr. Kulanong uh, and two at the back. Yep. So if you could stand up and, and uh, Martin in the middle as well. So we've got four questions. If you could, uh, well, let's take them all together and then we'll um, invite uh, a response from uh, Mr. Garnier. Um, if you call and have a, Dr. Kulanong, please. Uh, good morning uh, to you, uh, Mark. I think we last met about four years ago at the uh, Brunei Commission in London. So it's good to see you online. Um, my question to you is on the uh, CPTPP and uh, what are the benefits of the UK applying to the um, uh, session uh, of the CPTPP? And are there any particular sectors which you might be keen to still have? Thank you. Thank you very much. So for anyone that loves their acronyms, that's the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, we have two questions at the back. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It was just some tips. I'm um, going to manage the address process. Uh, my question is um, about the uh, regional conference Silicon Valley partnership, and um, it could be interesting to uh, to know to know better the UK's view about the RCMP. Okay, we're on a roll with acronyms. Second, another question at the back there. Hello everyone, um, I'm a student here in Maxamana College. Uh, so for my question for Mr. Gainian, uh, where are the opportunities for greater UK collaboration with ASEAN? Thank you very much. And we have one more question in the middle from uh, Mr. Martin William, William Martin, former chair. Thank you, Mr. Lai Allen. Uh, William Martin, past chairman of BBDF and director of training consultancy, Findlay Sidirian Baha. Uh, I was very interested in your comments about education because we are a student services agency. Uh, we send a great many of our students to the UK. And what we have noticed um, is a recurrent theme is people are missing being on site to study. There's actually even psychological damage coming up because they can't be with their mates. Uh, we see one of the priorities taking your education point into consideration of getting the UK and the universities safe, vaccinated, ASAP, as we are doing already, I believe. And that is going to be where those who are perhaps more risk averse will feel, yes, it is safe to come back. It is safe to take part in that education and benefit from it on site as opposed to remotely. Right. So the question boils down to where are the universities and 
and civil services in terms of vaccination priorities and making safe. Thank you very much. So Mark, we've got the CPTPP and RCEP and the UK's position on, on those trading agreements. Uh, opportunities for UK ASEAN uh, greater collaboration. And as um, uh, Mr. Marston was saying, the, uh, the psychological impact of students and, and moving back to the UK and the vaccination programme. Fantastic, thanks, Adam. Why, why, why don't I take COVID first and then I can go, go barreling into Acronym City and, uh, and do, do ASEAN, RCEP and CPTPP in, in a second. Um, so, um, so Martin, uh, look, I completely, uh, so sorry, William, rather, I, I completely agree. Um, it is a big problem. Uh, students need to interact with each other. The university experience is far more than just, just sitting online. Uh, and I can uh, bear testament to that as my son is sitting upstairs, um, having just broken up for his, um, his, his second term at York University, where he spent a total of, um, of two weeks at York University, um, and thereby completely missing out on the, um, on, on the experience. Um, we, we've got to get the universities back. Um, what I slightly fear is that there's a lot of these universities are talking about not actually coming back until September. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, um, is that the hybrid system works. They're not too sure if we're going to have another breakdown. We, we aren't going to be convinced of the rollout of the vaccines until really, you know, sort of July, I think it is, when we reckon we'll have everybody vaccinated in the UK. So the net result is, is that, is that some universities are going to try to come back next term, but most of them, I think, are probably not going to. Um, and, it, and, and, you know, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, you know, at the end of the day, people are spending quite a lot of money on, on university fees. They also pay for their accommodation and they're just not getting what they need out of it. And, and that interaction, that face-to-face -face network building that takes people through their whole lives is incredibly important. Um, we are obviously doing our best. It's, it's really important that we get the vaccination programme rolled out. And the order of priority has been uh, really to vaccinate those peoples who, who will suffer badly from COVID if they get it. And it's inevitably the case that the younger and healthier you are, the more likely you are to, to, to get through a bout of COVID with, with very limited um, symptoms. Um, and I've certainly come across people of a certain, you know, kind of teenagers and, and people in their early 20s who only ever knew that they had COVID because they were putting too much chilli in their chilli con carne that their lips burnt, that they couldn't taste it. Um, but beyond, you know, whereas at the other end of it, we've seen people who have been in hospital for months and of course, tragically, been in the UK, 125, 130,000 people have lost their lives as a result of, uh, of COVID. So we have to just roll through this on a, on a priority basis um, and then eventually get to the point where, where, um, where we can get students back into universities. Uh, I wish I could give you better news. I really do. It's um, but it is one of those things where we just have to deal with um, uh, with this this with this process in the best possible way in terms of making sure that the NHS is protected from another surge, and it can only be done by going for the most vulnerable people first. But the flip side of that is we are leading the world in terms of the, la the larger nations. Um, I think we're the third third most successful rollout of uh, of, of, of vaccination. Uh, on the planet so we're doing our best and it's it's, it's not been been entirely glum in the uk um acronyms cptpp um RCEP and uh, and asean um colin very good to see you again it's um uh, i remember when we met it was um uh, yes a few years ago um so it's uh, good to catch up um the I, I think all of those questions were really sort of looking at the at the advantages and the sort of sectoral areas which we want to um which we want to cover i mean i think the um with with um, ASEAN and uh, CPTPP, they're obviously sort of slightly different things um, for obvious reasons. And, and what we're looking for is, is dialogue partner with ASEAN and obviously a session with CPTPP. I mean, I think when it comes to CPTPP, the, um, one of the things that, that we are very keen to be is in the UK is really to come back and try to be a thought leader when it comes to, 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 to global trade. Um, you know, we've obviously been you know, participating in the European Union now for some, some four decades or so. Um, but during this collective um, referendum we had uh, four years, five years ago now, um, we obviously decided that we wanted to go it alone and, and have a different, different view. But that doesn't mean we want to be completely isolated from the rest of the world. Actually, what we want to do is to really play a greater part in how the rest of the world works. CPTPP is, is, is a trading relationship. It's a, it's a, it's a very sophisticated trading relationship across, uh, you know, um, as, as Alan said, across, across the Pacific, 
Um, it did, of course, include America. And we'll wait to see whether Bi uh, Joe Biden will want to bring it back in again. But um, obviously, President Trump did withdraw from it. Um, I, we, we, we want to trade um, and be a global nation. Um, trading is, is an obvious one, but it's, it's that global influence that I think is really important. Um, we try to, you know, as a country, pride ourselves on, on being able to leave places that we engage with a little bit better. We want to, we want to help you know, develop the world's world-based order. And there's a number of different ways we can do that. One of which is, of course, uh, in the World Trade Organization, which is you know, st struggling a little bit with the, um, with the failure of the Appellate Court. But, but I think getting involved in CPTPP, I think, is not only is it just something which we want to do in terms of, of, um, of being able to trade with, with, uh, with the CPTPP nations, but I think also it's, it's, it's a signal of our willingness to engage with the rest of the world and demonstrate that, that, that we're sort of, we're, you know, we are getting out, of, out there. Um, and I think that's the same with ASEAN. I mean, ASEAN, you know, we have very, very many friends in, 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 in ASEAN, um, certainly sort of as a result of the Commonwealth, apart from anything else. And I think that it's, um, that it's important that we recognize and, and see uh, these groupings for what they are, which is very collaborative, very positive um, organizations. And I think that um, making sure that we continue to, 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 to engage directly with these is, uh, is very, very important. Um, when it comes to RCAP, um, we, you know, we are, as I say, a supporter of free trade, um, you know, rules-based international trade. Um, we, we don't see the UK wanting to become uh, or wanting to join RCAP. Um, but we, you know, but it, having said that, obviously, we obviously you know, very keen to enhance our trade with, uh, with, with, with members of those nations. Um, where it comes in terms of the of the areas that we want to specialise in, I mean, there's no doubt about it that you know, kind of modern um, modern trade, you know, sort of modern Britain actually is you know largely a service based uh, economy, and, and certainly our strengths lie in the financial services sector. But we are you know also very good at, at certain other sectors, and certainly technology is something which also we pride ourselves on. And one thing which I'm involved in, sort of slightly separately from my role as Prime Minister Trade Envoy, but is um, but is the space sector. And I see extraordinary um, innovative technologies coming through in terms of you know how we can we can communicate through space and use space to um, uh, to do brilliant things. It's that technology that we're very very strong at. But I think also we can we can do a lot of collaboration with. So I think you know the obvious sort of service sector, law certainly is very important. Financial services are also very important. Um, and I think um, and I think then beyond that. Uh, as I say, our sort of technological um, innovation is also is also incredibly important. Um, so I hope that sort of covers covers everything. Thank you very much. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we, we're going to now um, invite uh, Ambassador uh, Ken to give his uh, keynote address. I'm just going to change the screen around. Uh, if I can invite uh, Ambassador Flaherty to turn on your video. There you are. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for joining us, Mark. We hope you can you stay if you can for the next uh, to listen into um, Ambassador's uh, keynote. Uh, ambassador Flaherty is the ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia for COP26. Prior to this role, he was the deputy ambassador to Italy, which is where I now understand you are physically located, um, and uh, and has worked on a wide range of issues from EU cooperation to security counterterrorism and migration, economic and energy issues, and the Middle East. You're now charged with championing COP26 to Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia. Could you please tell us a little bit more about what COP26 is and how we can get involved and, and be supportive of that? Over to you, Ambassador. Oh, you're on mute, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, welcome to, to all the members of the Britain Brunei Business Forum, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking to you today about our preparations for COP26. Um, so as you have heard, I am the COP26 Regional Ambassador for the Asia Pacific region, and my role entails engaging with governments, but also with business, civil society, media across the region um, to build momentum for climate action ahead of the COP26 um, summit in November at Glasgow um, later this year. So I will start by saying that um, 2021 is a critical year for our planet. Uh, we must accelerate 
progress towards keeping global mean temperature rises well below 2 degrees Celsius and limiting rises as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius, as was enshrined in the Paris Agreement five years ago. And whenever we host the UN Climate Conference, COP26, on November, um, the world will meet and they must be agreeing more ambitious action. So we are seeking to galvanize that action um, through five action areas. Um, first of all, and particularly relevant to the Asia region, we want to embrace the large clean growth opportunities of the energy transition by accelerating the transition from coal and fossil fuels towards clean energy. Um, secondly, we want to drive clean transport by speeding up the phase out of petrol and diesel engine vehicles from the roads over the next generation and to be supporting zero emission vehicle innovation. Um, thirdly, and we want to bring about a green transformation of the global financial system and ensure that financial support is available to those countries who need um, to take action on climate change um, and who are addressing the impacts of climate change today. Um, fourthly, uh, we would like to be helping to protect and restore natural habitats and ecosystems worldwide and to scale up nature-based solutions to address climate change. It's been proven that nature-based solutions can offer one third of the most cost-effective solutions to climate change. And we're keen to help partners worldwide um, leverage those opportunities. And then finally, um, supporting action around adaptation and resilience through helping communities prepare better for the impacts of climate change and helping them respond to the impacts which they're facing um, worldwide. Now, I'm particularly pleased that Brunei has made sustainability a theme of its ASEAN chairmanship, and I very much hope that Brunei will use its platform to increase climate action across the region. I've been very encouraged to see that Brunei has already committed to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 20% by 2030, and also by its commitment to increase the number of solar plants to control methane releases, ending routine flaring, and seeking 60% of vehicles sales to be zero emission vehicles by 2030, with the EV pilot program just having launched last week. I think these are very important steps, and I hope that Brunei will continue and consider developing a long-term strategy, including a commitment to eventual net zero emissions. Brunei, of course, has a better preserved environment than most countries in the region or indeed the world. And I think it has the opportunity to be a beacon for the wider region with 72% forest cover and aims to increase the protected forest reserve to 55%. Uh, Brunei really should be recognized for protecting its biodiversity, including as part of the Green Heart of Borneo initiative. I'm very pleased to be seeing these steps that the rest of ASEAN is also taking to support the clean energy agenda. And Vietnam is emerging as a new solar and wind superpower. The Philippines have recently announced a moratorium on new coal plants, joining the several countries which have abandoned coal plants and are investing strongly in renewable energy. And I'm convinced this does have the potential to drive growth and jobs in the years to come. Of COP26 presidency, we're clear that business has a central role to play in supporting and accelerating this progress. We know that many businesses are currently focusing on their COVID response, but it's important to maximise opportunities to recover better and put credible climate action at the heart of our recovery plans. And we know that businesses face increasing calls from their clients, from their customers, uh, their shareholders, and indeed their own employees to play their part in tackling climate change. So we're calling on companies to show increased ambition and to set net zero commitments by 2050 or sooner. Over 1,000 businesses around the world have already joined the race to zero, and I hope that Bruneian names feature amongst the ASEAN businesses who have joined and other non-state actors in the near future. Companies can join the Race to Zero through one of the Race to Zero's partner initiatives, which include the Business Ambition for 1.5 degrees Celsius or the SME Climate Hub. And the UK will, in partnership with Brunei as ASEAN Chair, be holding a UK ASEAN Race to Zero event at the end of May. So watch this space for further details. I strongly um, hope that uh, those in this room today will get involved and indeed spread the word. 
I'm clear that companies can play an important advocacy role. You can help out set out a positive vision for change with all partners, especially your supply chains and peers within your sector. We would ask you to support enhanced ambition from national governments, underlining the importance for you of a green and resilient recovery. Here in ASEAN, we have already seen the impact um, that business uh, can provide. For example, in Cambodia recently, um, international garment importers sent a joint letter to the government stressing the importance for them of access to renewable energy. We want to use the opportunity of COP26 to visibly move finance into low carbon and resilient investment that will maximise the overall environmental benefits and show to developing countries that finance will flow to sustainably support their economic growth. We also need to dramatically improve global business reporting on climate risk. Investors need to understand how extreme weather events, so physical risks, and the move to net zero, which is a transition risk, and will affect their business models and the associated financial impact. That requires an improvement in the quality, quantity and comparability of information that companies disclose around climate related risks and opportunities. You may have heard of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which has now become the go-to standard for such climate related financial reporting. A company's disclosures need not only cover what their emissions are today, but also what their plans are for their emissions tomorrow and the associated financial impact. That means assessing the resilience of companies, in particular large banks and insurers, strategies to a move to net zero. Investors and lenders need a way to identify which companies are on a credible path to transition to net zero and therefore less exposed to climate risk. And that means understanding what constitutes a credible transformation plan, how it's governed, so is compensation, for example, tied to success in achieving the plan, and also what are the short-term milestones to achieving the plan. The action of companies is also directly relevant to our other COP26 campaigns beyond finance. On the energy transition, renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels in over two thirds of countries worldwide, including in Asia. And it's very clear this trend will continue in coming years. Within just a few years, it will be cheaper to build new renewables than to run existing coal plants. Coal is therefore a doomed industry and new coal plants being built now are destined to become stranded assets in the future. But we need to deliver investment today in renewables to avoid companies facing uh, countries facing such burdens for decades to come. So we're encouraging businesses worldwide to join the Powering Past Coal Alliance, PPCA, and commit to either powering their operations without coal or restricting the finance of, of unabated coal power generation. Investors should also increase their investment in decarbonized power by, for example, in join, joining the UNPRI Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, the Climate Action 100 Plus. We encourage you today um, to commit to increased use of renewable energy by joining the RE100 initiative. And businesses can also raise internal ambition, advocating for increased product efficiency for high energy products such as refrigerators, motors, air conditioners and lighting. And businesses can support the global transition to clean transport. Against the backdrop of the recently launched EV pilot project, we're calling on all businesses with large fleets to commit to the uptake of electric vehicles. And finally, nature-based solutions can also provide some of the most cost-effective answers to global climate change. And you can support this by committing to due diligence on your supply chains for commodities driving tropical deforestation, such as soil, soy rather, palm oil, cocoa, and coffee. And businesses can also buy high quality nature-based carbon credits as part of a credible corporate net zero plan. So I hope that's given you some insights into how the UK COP26 presidency sees business as contributing to our global goals for urgent climate action. And we're very keen to continue to engage closely with companies across ASEAN and in Brunei specifically in the months ahead. As countries around the world are dealing with the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we mustn't lose sight of the continuing climate 
crisis. We all have a responsibility to act, and I think we need to work together to meet our shared goals under the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that very insightful keynote address. I'd like to invite questions and comments from the floor. As before, please raise your hands if you have a, a question or a comment and introduce yourself uh, for Ambassador. But if I can, uh, we'll come to Yvonne in, in a minute, but if I can just uh, take the prerogative of the first question. About 100 years ago, before oil and gas um, really took off in Brunei, a major export at the time was coal. Uh, and you've said that coal was a doomed um, uh, for the, from the start, from, from now. Uh, for when, Looking ahead in oil and gas, um, what sort of timeline do you think with the emergence of renewable energy, would you say that oil and gas is a doomed industry as well? Well, I think the future is clearly in the renewable sector. We're seeing um, the cost of solar energy and wind falling year on year. And so uh, if you draw a simple graph, um, it, it, they will become the cheapest sources of energy in pretty much every country. And worldwide. But of course for the UK, the oil and gas sector is an important sector for the UK economy um, and has provided considerable revenue um, for the government um, in, in recent decades. So what we are trying to do in the UK um, is to be helping the industry to transition. And so we recently announced plans for the North Sea, um, for example, agreed um, with industry to be helping um, the uh, companies operating in the North Sea um, to transition. Um, there are many um, useful skills within the industry which are very relevant to carbon capture and usage uh, uh, technology, for example, uh, and equally um, around um, the uh, conversion um, uh, of renewable energy into hydrogen um, and so forth. So it will be, uh, there will be useful skills um, which these companies can be delivering um, for the future. And we're also trying to ensure that there is support um, for the workers in those areas to transition to new green renewable jobs. So it's certainly um, something which is on our minds in the UK and we think that it is possible um, to be um, supporting the industry through the transition um, towards a greener, cleaner um, uh, source of energy. Thank you, Ambassador. Yvonne, you have a question? Uh, William, we've got a question, two more questions at the back. Yvonne, your question, please. Well, good morning to you over there, Ken, and everybody, good afternoon. It's uh, 5 p.m., I guess, now. Um, it's a great day to have this um, conversation. And um, to introduce myself, I'm actually the past uh, immediate chair of BPF. So I guess the BPF is a excellent uh, forum to be in as two past presidents, two past chair are right here today. My question. Um, what can micro SME or SME could do or they, what, what role can they play in this climate change? Great, well, very good question. And I think I mean, I addressed some of this in my speech. So there's obviously particular initiatives around um, Race to Zero designed um, for SMEs. So we would encourage um, SMEs to be joining um, that, that initiative. Um, but on a more practical basis, um, every day um, companies are making decisions around um, how they source materials, for example, so ensuring um, that you're doing so in a sustainable um, way, that you're buying products which don't contribute to deforestation, um, for example. Um, if you have a, a fleet of cars and you're renewing those cars, um, investing instead in electric vehicles um, would be one way of supporting um, the transition. Uh, and of course, um, working um, to deliver um, products which rely more on renewable energy uh, and less on, on other uh, forms of fuel um, would again uh, be, be supportive. And, and as I mentioned, I think there's also an important advocacy role um, for all companies, including SMEs, around communicating to governments um, worldwide um, the importance of action on climate change and delivering um, a, a green recovery um, from the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Ambassador. We have two questions at the back. If you could introduce yourselves and, and pose your question. Hold the microphone close to you so the ambassador can hear you. Hello and a very good evening to everybody and good morning to Ambassador Ken. My question for today for you is how can I galvanize my stakeholders to support climate action? And why don't we take the question next to you as well? Is there another question? Yeah, it's behind the pillar. 
Okay, um, hello. Uh, my name is Hazika Ali. I am a student from Naksamana College. Um, my question is, can you explain the race to zero in more detail? So the first question was, how do we galvanize our stakeholders? So we as ourselves and our own organization could be very passionate, but how do we get on board our, our supply chain, our suppliers, the people that buy from us, our clients, our stakeholders to be involved as well? And um, William had a question and Sivel's also got a question as well. So let's take those two questions and then we'll, we'll go to the ambassador for an answer, a response. Um, well, I'll maybe start with, with the latter question first. So the Race to Zero is, is bringing together companies worldwide um, which are committed um, to fixing net zero targets for their companies and to be um, compelling um, climate action um, through their business. Um, so there's, ma there's major uh, multilateral businesses involved, but as I mentioned, um, there's also scope for small and medium uh, sized enterprises to be involved as well. Um, the way in which companies um, deliver that action is very different um, from company to company. There's a lot of exchange of information within um, or rather between race to zero companies. So if you were to join, um, you would have access to, to examples of action from the companies themselves. So in some cases, um, it's around, um, if it's financial services, for example, implementing the TCFD recommendations, which I mentioned um, previously. With others, it will be action around um, electrifying um, their operations rather than relying on fossil fuels. It, it might be around, um, obviously, work action on their um, car fleets. Um, and identifying ways to deliver products um, which are more um, sustainable in the way that they are produced. But I would say there's not one size fits all. There are There is a whole range of activities which are possible uh, for companies to take. Uh, and the Race to Zero is a good way um, for companies to have access to, to ideas um, on how to address that um, in, in their individual cases. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot the second question. Uh, could you repeat it for me? Um, that the, so one was on the race to zero, which you've addressed. The other one was, even if we are passionate about climate change, how do we get the people around us, our stakeholders and customers and supply chain to be involved as well? Sure. Well, I mean, I think this, this is obviously a question which applies beyond companies. And I think um, there, there is a range of, of activities which we can all do um, uh, uh, to, to encourage um, climate action within the societies and economies with which we work. So, of course, that there's leading by example um, uh, and taking actions yourselves, um, which show um, uh, commitment um, to, to climate action. Um, in terms of um, uh, your supply chains, often we find that companies um, have to explain um, to their supply chains the importance for their customers. Um, of uh, uh, ensuring that their products are, are produced using renewable energy, for example, or are not um, produced using resources which are um, encouraging deforestation uh, within the region. Uh, and likewise, um, with customers, what we actually find is that there is already quite a strong demand uh, among customer bases worldwide um, for green products. Um, and, and consumers are increasingly aware of the need um, to ensure that their individual purchases do not contribute to global climate change. But there is a lack of information. So I think in both cases, I would be recommending dialogue, or recommending conversations, and of course, governments um, have an important role in, in championing that those kinds of conversa national conversations around the need for a transformative approach to how we uh, deliver goods uh, and products in a capitalist uh, economy. Thank you. And it's the simple things as well. I was very happy to see that the donuts outside were on uh, uh, recyclable, what looks like recyclable boxes rather than plastic. So well done to Luxemana for um, s sorting out your supply chain in terms of donuts. William, your question, please. Uh, good morning, Investor. Thank you very much for a very well delivered, um, straight to the point uh, and very knowledgeable speech. Uh, I was particularly interested in your five points of focus and four of them stood out. One was the growth bit, one was transport, one was support, one was adaptation. Very recently, Brunei held an exhibition for electric vehicles. And one of the things that pleased me greatly and answered one of my questions in terms of growth of sustainable and renewable energy was that Shell are developing charging stations for electric vehicles. The whole thing about 
a renewable, sustainable, clean energy policy globally is the infrastructure. And if people feel they cannot drive their car or whatever, adaptation and adoption is going to be slow. So in particular with COP26, my question is, how are people going to move forward in terms of making sure there is an infrastructure with financial support and perhaps even educational support in terms of university degrees in energy resilience or whatever you wish to call it? How can we move that forward at COP26 to give people credible, clear focus? Thank you very much. Great question. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have the um, transport campaign as part of our presence centred around um, zero emission vehicles. As part of that, we are trying to work with the major producer countries worldwide and the major markets um, for the products worldwide. Um, the issue at the moment with zero emission vehicles is that they are already cheaper to run um, than a petrol or, or diesel car, but they are much more expensive to buy at present. Um, but the market is already heading in the direction where, in a few years' time, um, the costs um, as production ramps up will be continuing to fall, much like solar energy. And therefore, within a few years, it will be cheaper to buy a zero emission vehicle than to buy a petrol or diesel car. And that will be totally transformational for the sector. And we expect there will be a sudden um, rush of consumers to the product and it will become increasingly uncompetitive and for producers to be producing anything other um, than zero emission vehicles. And our aim as presidency is to bring forward that date, that transition date, uh, when the zero emission vehicles um, are cheaper um, than petrol or diesel cars. And so that's why we're working with the major manufacturers, the major economies, um, to be pushing countries to follow um, the UK's lead. And we have set a 2030 date for the total phase out of petrol and the diesel cars, and the more countries worldwide do that, um, the more the market will get the signal um, that it is essential for them if they want to survive as manufacturers and to be ramping up um, production. And so we will see um, the virtuous circle um, of uh, costs falling. Um, you're absolutely right that infrastructure is key um, to deployment of that. We are trying in the UK uh, to be ramping up um, the um, installation of relevant charging sites within the UK. And this is obviously an area where the regulations and the um, role of government um, it is crucial. So we would be encouraging uh, governments worldwide um, to be helping um, deliver that uh, societal change. And I think once it happens, it will be a bit like the transition from horses um, to petrol cars a century ago. It will be very sudden. Um, and so it's important um, that the infrastructure is there um, to allow um, the, the transition to take place in as smooth a way as possible. Thank you. And of course, electric cars have got great horsepower these days. Siva, you'd like to ask a question. Good morning, Ambassador Ken. My name is Siva. I'm the CEO of uh, Luxembourg College of Business and the current chair, not the past chair, because I have two past chair, yeah? So the question would be, what role can the BUBF play in supporting climate action? The role of uh, BUBF that we can play for the, to support the climate change action. So this relates also to what was asked earlier in terms of um, stakeholders. What can societies and sort of the NGO uh, part of communities play in the ecosystem of trying to uh, raise the awareness and the importance of climate change? Well, I think it's essential that, that, that NGOs and, and, and um, other societies worldwide um, are an important um, impetus um, for climate action by governments. We've seen this in the UK, in my uh, country, um, but also um, worldwide, that um, people within societies um, are running out of patience with governments. We, we certainly feel this very strongly um, as presidency, that there is a very clear pressure from populations um, worldwide um, for urgent action. People see um, that we are not on track to limit uh, global warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. And they know that the consequences for them and for their children, for the, the entire economy, and will be catastrophic if action is not taken. Uh, and there is growing frustration, I think. And I think that the NGO um, sector in particular is a very useful vehicle 
um, for delivering um, that pressure um, uh, and making sure that it's heard by decision makers, both in government and business elsewhere. Um, I've been very pleased to be working with um, WWF and with other um, NGOs across um, the Asia Pacific region um, to help ensure um, that those voices are amplified uh, and in focusing on the practical solutions um, which are possible in, in different spaces. And so, for example, I was speaking in Malaysia um, just last week around nature based solutions, and it's clear um, there's dramatic potential in that area. Uh, I think that the NGO and societies um, have particular um, scope to be in some ways identifying the solutions which government um, can then Im implement. So I hope um, that, that our approach as presidency um, will help deliver that conversation um, between all parts of society because it's really clear that governments on their own um, will not deliver um, all the answers and neither will business. We all have to work um, together um, to deliver um, the 1.5 degree Celsius global warming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if I may, one final question before we end for today. The role of education, we're here in an, an academic institution. What is the role of, of um, education in educating our young people, not just the young kids, but all the way through up to colleges and, and universities? How can education play a role in uh, combating climate change? Well, I think this is, this is crucial, isn't it? I mean, clearly um, the information um, debate um, needs to continue and we need to make, ensure that all parts of society understand the scale of the problem um, which is facing us and, and the need for quite serious decisions about how our, our economies are structured. Um, it's quite revealing, I think, that the world has come together um, to fight the COVID-19 pandemic um, on the basis of scientific advice. And I think in some ways that does um, provide some hope that we can tackle the other um, great crisis of our generation around climate change through um, science-based um, uh, logical uh, solutions. Um, but that requires um, the educational um, process you've described um, to ensure that all parts of society understand the scale of the problem and, and what solutions are needed. I would also say it's relevant um, to the fact that as presidency, um, we very much see youth as a crucial partner um, in delivering our objectives. Our, we are running COP26 in partnership um, with Italy, and Italy will be hosting a, a youth COP um, uh, later this year as well. And so I have the pleasure to be meeting youth groups across the region. I haven't yet in Brunei, but hopefully um, before, before COP26 that will be possible. And I, I've been very inspired to be hearing from them about um, their commitment to tackling climate change and to be driving action uh, within their countries. So I hope um, the, the same will be true in Brunei. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much for your, your comments and your uh, wonderful insight. I'd now like to invite uh, Siva to give some closing remarks uh, and to thank um, our wonderful speakers and our guests today. Siva, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the BBBF, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, Mark and Ken, for, sp sp for speaking this afternoon See, I lost the words. So amazing. We're taking questions from the audience. Thank everyone in the audience too for attending and for participating in the lively dialogue. I would also like to thank Ms. Natalie Bounce, the Deputy High Commissioner, and her team for, co for coordinating this event with BUPF. Lastly, my thanks to Ellen Lai the moderator and the chair of this afternoon dialogue and not forgetting the team from Luxembourg College of Business for assisting in the smooth running of today's event. Thank you and I wish all of you a pleasant evening. Thank you very much, Siva. And please, another round of applause for our wonderful speakers. Mr. Mark Garnier, the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Brunei and Ambassador Kenneth Flaherty, the COP Ambassador for Asia. Pacific and South Asia. Thank you very much for joining us today. If you are interested in finding out what else is happening in the region, the UK ASEAN Business Council is hosting a discussion on e-mobility in Indonesia tomorrow. The details are on our website. Uh, Indonesia are doing a massive drive to uh, get uh, electric vehicles, uh, electric buses, and all forms of uh, electric um, mobility into the roads in Indonesia. So do join us for that. And we're always welcome to join any of the UK ASEAN Business Council's uh, online events as well. 
Thank you very much for joining us today. Stay in touch with the Britain Brunei Business Forum and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.